Psalm chapter 16. Psalm chapter 16. Kind of bring to a conclusion what we started this morning. I was thinking as the fathers were singing, we talked this morning about <clears throat> centering our life on Him or keeping Him at the center of our life. And if you wonder, where would I start to do that? Uh, well, memorize that song that they just sang and repeat that over and over and over throughout the week, and that would be a good place to, to begin. So we're excited uh, to be back with you and look forward to unfolding what's left in this particular chapter for us. Let's have a quick word of prayer, and then we'll do a quick review and, and then finish up this chapter. Father, we ask that you would, uh, again, encourage us tonight, uh, as David will illustrate to us here the benefits of making you the center of our life. So I pray that you'd encourage these folks uh, this evening. Uh, certainly, I doubt that there's anything here that we're not aware of, and yet how often we get uh, lose sight of these things just because of the pressures of this world. So thank you for the time that we'll have over these next few minutes just to focus our attention on you, and uh, thou certainly art worthy, worthy of our worship worthy of our praise and our adoration, and I pray tonight that you will be uplifted and that we will be encouraged as we center our attention on you. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning we were looking at, and by way of quick recap and introduction, I had shared with you the quote, uh, the gentleman that shared, Lord, I know you are all I have, but I don't know you well enough for you to be all I need. And so we spent some time unpacking how do we know God or what is it about God that we, we ought to know. And David, as we looked in verses 1 through, I guess 1 through 6, gave us uh, these statements of who God is, who God was or who God is in his life. And we noted that in verse number 1 that David said, in thee, so that means he put his trust in God. God was the center of his life. And one of the first things that he teaches us here early in this passage is that God is our trust. And we talked at length about that. The second thing we saw in verse number 2 was that he is our Lord. And we drew a distinction between capital L-O-R-D and the little case L-O-R-D. And the idea that God is, yes, Yahweh, but he is also sovereign or king that uh, can direct and rule our life because of his, his position. Then we dropped down into, I guess it was verse number 4, and we saw that He is the sole object of our worship. And we talked at length about multitude idols uh, will bring multitude of sorrows. And so uh, we cannot have a multitude of idols or things that draw our attention away from God without experiencing frustration and discouragement and all the things that come with that. But as our focus is on Him, and He's the center of our life, He's that hub in our will, uh, we begin to roll through life much more smoothly because we've worshipped Him. He's the object of our worship. Number four, and I guess it was four and five, I combined them all this morning, but we saw in verses five and six, David said that the Lord was His, uh, he said there in verse number five, he said it was His, his inheritance. Uh, we talked about that. We said that He was the portion of His cup. It was His portion. And then we talked about the idea that he maintainest my lot. And so we walked through all of those this morning. Now, those were things that David, as he's reflecting on life and he's looking about him, uh, he brings to mind who God is. And what I want us to focus on this evening is this. What are the benefits that David enjoyed because he centered his life on God. God was the center of his life. What are the benefits that you and I can enjoy because we have paid, placed our pleasure, if you will, in the Lord Jesus Christ? We're, 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 he is the one that fulfills us. He's the one that fills us. He's our portion. He's our inheritance. He's our lot. And uh, what happens when we shift our focus in that direction? It's interesting. There is a truth here that I'll kind of start with, and I mentioned it this morning, but if you'll note back up in verse number 2, 
David indicated that he was having a conversation with himself. He said, oh, my soul. Now, we could take a long time and go through the Psalms and look at all the different passages of Scripture where David was having conversations with himself. And we talked about that a little bit this morning, that one of the most important conversations that we'll have each and every day is the, the conversations we have to ourselves about what we're thinking, what we're feeling, the emotions that we're engaged in at that moment. Now, I know that you could be driving down the road and maybe you're, you, you seem like you're singing to whatever's playing on the radio, but the reality is you're, you're carrying on a conversation with yourself. And that, that's okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's highly encouraged from the scriptures. But one of the things that, that I note about this, when David starts to talk to himself, when we get to verse number seven, his outlook changes. At one point in time, and you see this throughout all of the scriptures, at one point in time we may be thinking a certain way or feeling a certain way or concerned about a certain thing. And when we shift our focus to who he is, it changes us inside out. It changes our outlook. And you'll see that in, in a minute when we get down to, to verse number 7. Uh, I use a phrase in a lot of the teaching that I do. And uh, the phrase is, what you focus on expands. In other words, what holds your attention, you tend to see more of. We were, we were on our way home today. Uh, I think the Weathertons were behind us, so I hope y'all didn't see this. Uh, but we were on our way home today, and uh, I, I, we were driving down, was at Cypress Garden Road, and I just, something over to the left caught my eye in that little subdivision up there. And uh, I was just looking at that, and the next thing I know, Tracy's calmly, very calmly, um, what are you doing? And I happened to look up, and well, I, you know, you're supposed to be in the right lane. I was pretty much all the way in the left lane. Now, fortunately, the cars that were coming were, well, they were a little ways away. They were coming. The point, though, in the illustration that struck me is where my focus is is where I end up. And I'm just looking, and the car's just drifting over here. Now, fortunately, calmly, she brought me back into position. Uh, every now and then, it's a smack upside the head that brings you back into position. But this time, it was a nice, calm thing. But the truth is, uh, where we focus is what holds our attention. And David... He's not focused on circumstances, which he could be, right? He's been anointed king, but he's not king. He's running for his life in many situations. He has a, a lot of difficulties that are taking place and people trying to kill him. And yet he focuses on who God is. And when he focuses on God, it changes what he begins to do. So let's draw our attention, quick light, to verse number 7 and look at here... I think I have three or four benefits of living a life centered on God. Notice in verse number 7. You have to watch the first phrase because it's pretty neat. David begins, after talking about who God is, in verse number 7 you have a transition and he says, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. Now, the first point I want you to take away... Uh, and then we're going to, have to come back and give a sub point. But the first thing, the first blessing that we receive when the Lord is the center of our life is that we receive counsel. We receive counsel. And so David here in verse number seven says, Who hath given me counsel? My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. But before we do that, you'll notice the first phrase. The first phrase is, what happens immediately after he's focused on who God is? Immediately he says, I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord. So the, the application for all of us is this. Once we focus on who God is and what God is doing in our life and what God has done in our life, it begins to place into perspective the challenges, the struggles, the difficulties with which we're faced. And all of a sudden when David who easily could be distracted by everything going on around him, centers his attention on who God is, he can't help but praise God. He can't help but bless his name. And, and, and so in, in these challenges times, David does that. And you can relate to that. Life has trials. Life has burdens. Life has challenges. We, we've seen those. It really in, <laughs> we've seen them in our church. Uh, since the beginning of the year. 
Now, we, we've had challenges even into 2020, but we've seen challenges physically, and, and we, we've seen that. We, we've had uh, funeral services that we've attended. We've seen trials and challenges and burdens that take place. But, 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 but one of the neat things that we saw this morning, if you were to go back and unpack all of those things that David said about God, there was a thread that ran through every one of those. And the thread that ran through every one of those was this, this little tip that God was attentive to everything that was taking place in David's life. And so here David, he finishes up talking about who God is and he stops and he says, you know what? God's been aware of everything. He's been attentive. He knew my lot. I could trust in him. He's my portion. All of those things indicate God's attentiveness in our lives. And so even though we may feel as if, where is he? He's there. He, he, he's aware and when David focused on that, he said, wow, I just, I, I, I just want to praise God. I want to bless His name. I want to thank Him and worship Him, and He's worthy of that worship. So as he meditated on who God is to him or was to him, it affected, it affected his inside, which impacted his outside. You know, something else that drew into my attention was his phrase here, I would bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. There's a whole lot there too, but his reins is indicative of what's taking place within. And so as he focused on who God is, it began to impact him inside. His heart, his mind, his emotions. We, you know, keep thy heart with all diligence. Uh, and be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, okay? And, and bring into captivity every thought and imagination. And the idea behind all of those principles is as David is focusing on who God is, it reigns, his inside, it's changing who he is. It changes where his focus is. And through those things, God gives him counsel. God gives him counsel. I was thinking about that. I wonder what counsel he got in the night season. Could it be that maybe it was then? This is all conjecture, I know. But it's fun to do that every now and then. Could it have been that at that moment he said, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord? Maybe that was a night season for him. Or maybe it was, you know, uh, we understand uh, the Bible principle, in all thy ways acknowledge him in what? He shall... Direct thy paths. So here is David wanting to shout from the mountaintops, praise God because he guides me. He gives me counsel. He gives me counsel. And of course at nighttime certainly sleep may evade you as well. I think I've entered that season of life. Surely tell me it goes away. Uh, 2 a.m. Uh, we, were, we were talking the other day. I, I woke up at 11 p.m. and went, man, that was a great night of sleep. <laughs> well, it's only been an hour and a half. So if we wake up in the night and a good thing to do is to pray and to meditate and to talk to God and uh, allow Him in that night season, if you will, to counsel us and to guide us and to encourage us. So number one, blessing of making God the center of our life is He gives us counsel which means he gives us direction, he gives us guidance. Number two, verse number eight. David said this, he says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Here's the second benefit of making the Lord the center of your life. The second benefit is he received stability. So in verse 7, he received counsel. In verse number 8, he received stability. Now, do you notice something about the very beginning of verse number 8? He says, I have set the Lord always before me. And I don't want us to miss that statement because that statement is indicative of something that's very, very important. What did David do? David made a choice. He made a deliberate choice choice that he was going to set 
the Lord before him. In that beginning phrase, it was a deliberate choice with deliberate actions. It wasn't as if he just made it through the week and added Jesus into his life. No, no, no. He made a deliberate choice, a deliberate decision, a very specific commitment that I will set the Lord before me. I think of Daniel. Daniel what? Purposed in his heart. He made a decision. And so here's David, he says, you know, I know who the Lord is, but I am deciding that I am going to set Him uh, before me. And besides, when you put that together, we know that God was always before Him. You read through the life of David, God was with him. God was at His right hand. God, God was providing for him. God was offering means of escape and protection and, and all of these things that God was doing for David. And David was constantly aware, here's a key, constantly aware of the presence of God in his life. Think about that. You say to yourself, John, how do I make God the hub, the center of my life? David made a deliberate choice that he was going to set says there again in verse 8, he was going to set the Lord always before him. That means he was constantly aware of God's presence in his life. You know, one of the things that I've thought about in, in a number of different ways and different applications, but you have in the New Testament a lot of, um, uh, a lot of commands, things to, to do that, that we ought to do. And one of the ones that has resonated... Uh, in my mind on a, on a regular consistent basis, it's a little one, but it's, it's pray without ceasing. Now, now, what does that do for us, to pray without ceasing? Well, when we pray without ceasing, it helps us set the Lord always before us. And it, and it helps us to keep Him centered, keep God centered, keeps our life centered. And so when the command pray without ceasing, I'm walking around all the time, the idea is that I am consciously, consistently aware of God's presence. And at any time, any time, talking to Him, uh, asking for direction, asking for counsel, asking for wisdom, asking uh, somebody pops into our mind. Sure, there's a a, a, a dedicated time of prayer, but, but Paul gives us that principle and it helps us stay centered on who God is. And so what did David do? He didn't allow circumstances to uh, dictate his decisions. He didn't allow things that are taking place around him to uh, change his direction. He said, no, I'm going to set the Lord always before me. Why? Because he's at my right hand and notice I shall not be moved. See, that's the blessing. Stability. Stability. Why is it that most don't have stability? It's because their focus is on everything but the one that provides stability. I'm going to fix this problem myself or I'm going to trust in someone else to fix it. My job is going to take care of this or my doctor will take. And, and we have all of these things that we think provide stability. And the reality, David says, no, why don't we just set the Lord always before us. And when we do that, number one, he's not going anywhere. He's at my right hand. But number two, he'll give us stability. He'll give us stability. So there's, there's a second blessing from this. Follow his direction and we shall not be moved. Number three, number three. So number one, David receives counsel. That's a blessing. Number two, David receives stability. Now, number three is wrapped up in verses nine and ten, and I'll come back and talk about those a little bit when I get to number four. But number three is this. He enjoyed three things, gladness, joy, and hope. He enjoyed gladness, joy, and and hope. Now look at verse number 9. David says this, therefore. Now why is it therefore? Therefore because he gets God's counsel. Therefore, he set the Lord before him. Therefore my heart is glad. And my glory rejoiceth. There's the joy. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Now, 
couple things in here that we'll, we'll slowly unpack. Uh, obviously, there is a prophetic look, particularly in verse number 10. We know that in the New Testament, both Paul and Peter uh, refer to this particular verse. And we also understand that there's a reference here to our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll see that in, in just a moment. So there is a prophetic look here. But one of the things that David says here is that I'm glad, I have joy, and I have hope. I have hope. And hope is such a powerful, powerful thing that only us as believers truly have. Amen. Only us have hope. Some can only hope in what they have today, but we can go way beyond where we are today. We have hope in an eternity. See, David could face death, but he could also face life because he had hope. Yes, we all know that when we die, we will be in heaven. Absent with the body, present with the Lord. We have hope for eternity. We know that. We're going to have one day a glorified body. We have that hope. But please, let's don't, understand, let's don't misunderstand the fact that we also have hope to live today. It's not just about tomorrow, and that's going to be really great. You'll see again when we get to verse number 11. But God says one of the benefits that you and I have today is we have hope. We have hope that He's going to be with us. We have hope that whatever lot He casts for us will be the right lot. We have hope that we can trust in Him. We have hope that as we worship Him and uplift Him, His presence is in our life. Everything that David had outlined in those first six verses give hope us a hope that nobody else can have. Only us as believers. I was thinking about a couple of verses here. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Not only that, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 19 through 20, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So we have hope here, but we also have hope for an eternity in heaven. Whatever we're going through today will be a blip before long. And it won't even matter much. Because we have that hope. And this is David. He says there in verse, you're not going to leave me at my soul in hell. Verse number 9, my heart is glad, my glory rejoice, my flesh rests in hope. And there's a great benefit of keeping God at the center of our life. And number 4 in verse number 11. So not only this, David received counsel. That's a benefit of keeping God's center of your life. Number two, David received stability. Number three, he received or enjoyed gladness, joy, and hope. But number four, and I've alluded to it in a different, couple of different ways, but I, I think it's important for us to end on this note. I won't put this as a past tense. This is present. One of the benefits of keeping God at the center of our life is David enjoys God now and forever. David enjoys God now and forever. Notice again in verse number 11, he says to God, in his, as he's having this conversation, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. You know, the path of life, the path of life is not just how to live in this present world, but it includes that. What am I supposed to do tomorrow? What does my day need to be like tomorrow? Keep him at the center of your will and he'll show you the path. It's not a secret. Eric talked about that this morning in Sunday school. God's will is not some secret that we can't know. It's available for us. But, but, but if I'm trying to live my own life, forget knowing God's will. Keep Him the center and He'll show me the path of life. David, all of these things that God was doing for him and he came to the conclusion because of who he is, 
I know what the path of life is. Now, don't miss this, though. Where does the path of life lead? Notice where the path of life leads. It leads to heaven. It leads to heaven. Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So the path of life, it's not just how to live in this present world. The path leads to heaven, and what's the focal point of heaven? It's our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the focal point of heaven. And so Jesus will be with it in His presence, and we'll worship Him. And as, as they sang, He's worthy of our worship, and with all of eternity, as we worship Him and we experience His pleasures... Forevermore. You know, we saw that in verse number 10. Jesus came and died for us. We know this truth. He came and died for us, but He didn't stay in the grave. We know that because His body, it says, Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. He didn't stay in that grave. His body didn't get decayed. He rose again in three days. And and all of those things... Are, are so significant for us because when David says in verse number 11, in thy presence is fullness of joy. Yes, in heaven. But he's in our presence as we speak. He's with us now. See, he's alive. He's out of that grave. He's at the right hand of the Father. And do you know he intercedes on our behalf? And he sent a Holy Spirit as a comforter. We can enjoy His presence today. And I think sometimes we get overwhelmed with the things happening around us that we forget to allow the joy of the Lord to be our strength. And so what David does here is he simply says this, God, I know who you are. I know who you are to me. And he gives us this list of who God is which changes his outlook. What you focus on expands. And he sees who God is, and he begins to praise God. And as a result of that, he has counsel. He knows what to do, when to do it, where to go, all of those things. He has counsel. We also know that from the counsel, he has stability. He has an anchor that's sure, steadfast and sure. It's his Lord Jesus Christ. He has an anchor. Then he gets down into verse number 9 and 10 and he says, I'm glad, I have joy, I have hope. And then what we see in verse number 11 is that he enjoys God's presence now. I think I mentioned it this morning, but I'll close with this thought. If it's okay, we'll close a little early. I'll close with this thought. We are going to enjoy his pleasures evermore so why would we not want to start doing today what we're going to be able to do for eternity enjoy his presence enjoy his presence keep him at the center of our life there's a song a hymn the chorus goes I won't certainly not singing it but the words of the chorus are this all that I need He will always be all that I need till His face I see. All that I need through eternity. Jesus is all I need. May we come to the place where we center our life on Him, see Him who He as He is, understand, allow that truth to transform how we see the world around us and enjoy the blessings that we have because we're children of God. Father, we thank you for these truths that we pull from Psalm 16. Thank you for what David shows us, the the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in the writings. Thank you, Lord, for the illustration of what can happen to our outlook about things going on around us when we focus on who you are. And God, we're thankful that you do show us the path of life and we do thank you that in your presence there is joy. And Lord, I pray that in the midst of all that takes place around us that we will make a determined effort like David that we will set you before us and we allow you to be the center of our life. Be with these folks this week. Thank you so much for their faithfulness, for being here this evening. 
I do pray that you'd meet every need that they have. Lord, I pray that you'd give them the desires of their heart as well. Thank you for loving us, all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen.